Okay, so the QMOD PCA um, is actually uh, in in multivariate analysis. Uh, QMOD PCA is sometimes uh, is also known as uh, principal coordinates analysis. Yeah, PCOA. If you see people uh, mentioning this PCOA analysis, uh, it's actually a kind of PCA, but at uh, the Q mode, yeah? So again, it's actually a similar kind of, uh, a kind of PCA, but with uh, some minor differences, all right? So in Q mode PCA, you, you have, uh, you generally have a situation where your number of variables is larger than the number of samples uh, that you have. Uh, this can be very common with, with modern data sets, yeah? Especially when, when uh, the generation of variables is, is actually quite uh, convenient, okay? So you will generally get this kind of um, uh, data sets all right, uh, when you deal with uh, data sets, they're actually quite, quite big, All right? Now, <clears throat> so, so in order to apply a PCA for dimensional reduction, so we cannot use the usual R mode PCA because there's a mathematical requirement for the sample size to be larger than the number of variables. But um, you can actually uh, still perform a dimensional reduction as follows, yeah. So instead, instead of doing the eigen decomposition on the covariance or correlation matrix, we perform the eigen decomposition on um, a kind of a distance matrix, right? So you you uh, can actually calculate the distance between different data vectors, all right? So what this means is as uh, is the following. Write something. Uh, we'll share my thoughts. Um, can you see my whiteboard? Okay, it's come out already, all right. So, so you have uh, your, your data structure will look something like this. Um, wait, screen share is paused, resume share. Stop the share this. Screen, screen share whiteboard. Okay, right. So you have, um, so your data looks like this, right? Uh, so this is uh, variable one, variable two, variable three, and so on, okay? Variable P. So this is your sample. Sample one, two, three, four, five, right? And sample N, okay? So you may have some values here. Uh, Some, just, just some values, okay? And uh, maybe here, this is uh, two, this is 0 0.5, 1, 1.2. Okay, and so on and so forth, right? So, so this is what we call a, a data vector, right? So each sample has its own data vector. Okay. For example, the data vector for the first sample would be 4.1, 1, 0, 2.5, 5.1, okay? This is what it meant, what is meant by a data vector. Now you can calculate the distance uh, between the data vector one and two. So it's denoted by uh, the index here, right? One, two means the distance between one and two as follows. Um, 
So the distance will be you you look at the path here. Or you, you go you go by uh, variables, yeah. So first variable four point one minus two, then you square, okay. Then after that you move to the second variable, uh, which is one minus zero point five square, right? And then you keep on doing this until you reach the last one. Sorry, this minus four point nine square. Okay. Um, if you have the Euclidean distance, uh, the Euclidean distance, you put a square root through the whole thing. Um, for Q mode PCA, it works with the squared Euclidean distance. Squared Euclidean distance. So therefore, you don't actually have to do the square root, all right? So you remove the square root. So basically, it's just the uh, uh, sum of differences, yeah? So in, in general, you sum, sum the differences between the two observations for each variable, and then you take the square, right? You, you sum the squares, all right? So basically, in general notation, it will be x. Um, so you have variable, so one i, sorry, uh, one i minus, this is two i, right, squared, and then you sum the i's from one until p, yeah? So your d, one, two will be like this, okay? So basically you have a distance, you can calculate the distance between one, two, one, three, one, four, and so on. So, and then calculate all the pairwise distances. Uh, so finally you will have a distance matrix, yeah, d, so this is, uh, these are the samples, one to n. So these are the samples, one to n, right? So on the diagonal is the distance of sample one with sample one, okay? So definitely your diagonal is zero, all right? And uh, the off diagonals will be um, your distance, right? This is D1, 2, this is D1n. Um, this matrix is symmetric because uh, the distance from 1, 2, and 2, 1, they are the same, yeah? Okay, you basically just swap the two positions here, but since you're taking the square, uh, it doesn't matter the order of uh, subtraction, right? So basically, you have a triangular, uh, so the matrix is basically um, symmetric. So this part and this part are the same, okay? They are the same. Right, so this is what we call a distance matrix. Right, and once you have this distance matrix, um, before you do eigen decomposition, uh, there is a transformation that you will apply to this distance matrix. So the transformation is the following. Yeah? So you take, so this is your distance matrix. D1, so, so this will be zero. D1, two, D1, three, until D1, N, um, N, okay, and so on, right? Um, so the transformation is that you take the D, I, J, the transformation, this denotes a transform, right? It's equal to the, uh, uh, the i row, right? So this, let's say this is i, this is the j, yeah? You take the average across the i row, you add the average across the j row, okay? And then you subtract, um, subtract the average, and then you subtract the i, j. And then after that, you average them, okay? So basically, uh, what it does is the following. So you, you take, uh, for example, let's look at one example. So suppose you have, um, you want to calculate uh, D12, right? So D12, you will find, um, 
So Ti, so that will be T1, the average of T1. So it goes like this, all right? You can find, um, right? So you have the, so you have uh, the, the one, two plus until the one end, right? You average out, right? So that will be uh, so three plus another zero here, right? So you, add, you divide by n, okay? So this will be your D1 uh, average. And then uh, for the other column, so the, for the column that's two, right? So you will uh, find this column, okay? So all the values in this column, right? You, again, you average them, right? So that will give you D2 average, right? So you add the average in this row, at the average of the entries in this column, um, you subtract D bar. D bar is you average the, all the values in this matrix. Okay, that means you add every value in this uh, distance matrix and you average by the total number. Yeah, so that will uh, give you D bar. Then and then you subtract the value itself. Yeah, then you subtract the IJ, which is this value. Okay, okay, this value. Yeah. So you do this transformation, you do this uh, operation, you divide by two, you get um, a transformed um, distance, okay? Uh, between sample i, j, all right? So, so from your distance matrix, you do this transformation, you will still get a distance matrix, but the entries, uh, so the entries here will be something else, right? There'll be uh, D, I, J, star, right? And uh, after you do the transformation, the diagonal is no longer zero, yeah? The diagonal is uh, something else, okay? So once you have this, uh, uh, this transform distance matrix, you will do eigen decomposition, okay? So we'll do eigen decomposition on this uh, distance matrix, and this will produce your usual eigenvalues and eigenvectors, right? Which you will use that to construct your uh, principal components, right? So your first principal component will be the eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue obtained from the eigen decomposition of the distance matrix. Okay, so, so um, in a nutshell, this is uh, what is done in uh, QMode PCA, all right? Um, now, this, this method is actually equivalent to another uh, matrix operation. Let me show you this, okay. Um, okay, so this matrix operation is called um, SVD, uh, the uh, singular value decomposition. In fact, in R, this is what is actually done rather than the eigen decomposition on the uh, uh, squared uh, Euclidean distance matrix. Yeah, um, <clears throat> but they, they, they both of them actually yield um, identical similar results. Right, so. And it's just that this this uh, particular method of calculating the uh, eigenvectors uh, is more numerically stable. Okay. So uh, just to quickly uh, run you through this uh, singular value decomposition, yeah. So uh, what it does is that um, your distance, sorry, your data matrix X, yeah, all right, which is the row is the rows are your samples, the columns are your variables. They are decomposed into a product of three matrices, right? They can be written as uh, three matrices, the matrix U, the matrix S, and the matrix uh, V, right, transpose, okay? Um, so this U matrix, uh, it has uh, the column as, uh, it's called the left singular uh, matrix. The columns are uh, actually uh, what we call left singular vectors, okay? And your 
matrix in the middle is uh, n times p. It's actually a matrix of singular values, right? Um, at the main diagonal, right, and zeros elsewhere. So now this this uh, matrix S is actually a rectangular. Is actually a rectangle, but it still has. Uh, so maybe I just write it down here. So your matrix S is n times p, right? So so the so in the the. Uh, It may be like here, there may be n, and over here p, right? So in this, for example, if your p is larger than your n, um, which in this case it is, so it will be something like this. It will terminate at uh, s, p, p. And then these are all zeros. So it will end up, uh, so this is what we call, so it will end up, uh, you may have uh, a block here, that's all zeros, okay? So this part here is called the main diagonal. Okay, in the usual, uh, if you have a square matrix, then your diagonal is basically just uh, over here, right? Because if you have a square matrix, uh, it's uh, n times n, some, some matrix m times m, right? So uh, the main diagonal will be this part, okay? Whereas for the uh, rectangular matrix, you can still have a main diagonal, but it's up to this part, yeah? So the rest are all zeros for this matrix, okay? And then, um, okay. So the VT, V transpose is a P times N matrix of right singular vectors. Okay. Now, uh, it turns out that the, these matrices are, uh, uh, are related to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors as follows. Okay, so, the, the, the values in the main diagonal of S, uh, they are actually a uh, square root of eigenvalues multiplied with square root of n minus one, yeah? Um, and the associated eigenvectors are the column vectors of Vt, all right? So the eigenvectors are actually uh, in Vt, and, um, and your principal components are actually the product, all right? The columns in the product U of S, okay? So this is just to let you know the, the we, we won't go into the, the detailed theory, uh, just to let you know uh, that what corresponds to what in this uh, uh, singular value decomposition. Yeah? Um, okay. <clears throat> All right, so let me just go back to the board. So basically you have your X is equal to U, S and V transpose, right? Uh, so your U is some matrix like there's some kind of a, I would say U1, U2. So this is N times P, yeah? So there will be, so this will be P, okay. So this is actually a vector, yeah? So so it, it's a column vector like so this. It will be N times N, is it? This is uh, N times P, so this is, uh, oh, okay, it's N times N, yeah, sorry. Thank you for the correction. Okay, is this N times N? is n times p and this is uh, p times p times p is it? oh let me check the notes again should yeah right right it should wait let me see this should, this should be um Uh, it's P times N.
Okay, let me see. This is uh, I wrote p times, and then then you can't get. I think it should be P times P, but I'm not so sure whether if the notes is a bit different. Okay, uh, let me check check the dimension again. Uh, U is N times N. But then your eigenvectors, you you basically have okay. Uh, okay, now my let me check the the this thing again and and get back to you later. Um, I may have uh, made a mistake somewhere uh, with one of the dimensions. Okay, but anyway, um, so so this this uh back, this matrix here it gives the so the so the columns here, um, this is a P, so, so the columns here are actually uh, made up of vectors, yeah? Okay, and this, these are your eigenvectors, okay? So, so of course there is an algorithm to decompose uh, this matrix into these three matrices, all right? Uh, but we won't go into that, okay? It's just that after it has been decomposed into these three matrices, then um, you can get the eigenvectors from this matrix. You can get the um, uh, eigenvalues from this matrix, and uh, you can get the principal components by uh, from the product of these two two uh, matrices. Okay. So this is a singular value decomposition. Um, this is what uh, R actually does in. The function PR com. Okay. Um, so for R mode, R uses the function print com. For Q mode, R uses the function PR com. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let me share, go back to the notes. Okay, so, so here I give you an, an example of applying Q mode uh, PCA. So uh, if you have the, uh, if you can access this data file, the much skipper data file, yeah. So, it contains a, a data matrix with 17 rows and 29 columns, right? So there are actually more variables than um, your samples. So in this case, if you want to do dimensional reduction, you, uh, you can only do Q mode PCA, right? Uh, so just to give a little bit of background, so basically this is just a, a data set to study um, Variation in body shape, yeah, of three uh, mudskipper species. Okay, um, yeah, these three mudskipper species here, um, and uh, in this data set, one of the column is a class label, right? So this is normal. Okay, now the 
the variables there actually correspond to something called um, they are actually coordinates, yeah, uh, Procrustes coordinates of uh, landmark positions. Okay, um, if you look at the image, right? So, so I've put in the appendix uh, the original diagrams from the sources so that you know what the variables actually are. So you can see that uh, the fish here, right? So of course the fish is already, is a, from a specimen, so you can actually uh, lie it, like put it like flat, and then um, take a picture, all right? And then you can uh, digitize uh, certain positions on the image. And these positions are positions that, that have some kind of uh, meaning to the biologist, right? Some particular positions that kind of like more or less capture the shape, it's called a landmark. So after you take the position, it's basically a coordinate, right? So this is a Cartesian coordinate, right? It has some, I mean, like based on some arbitrary uh, Cartesian coordinate, right? And after that, what it does is that there's a kind of a processing of the, the coordinates, okay? So coordinate is a pair of values, right? X and Y. So one landmark has two coordinate values. Um, you can put it, you can actually expand that. So you have got 14 landmarks, so it will generate 28 variables, yeah? Because the X coordinate becomes one variable, the Y coordinate becomes one variable. Um, this is something that you may feel like um, uh, new to you because you never thought that you can actually convert a coordinate, a pair of values into uh, variables, right? And do some kind of clustering on that. So, but again, uh, it's actually doable. In fact, this is telling you that uh, you can actually work with coordinate data just as a usual variable, okay? Just turn the X coordinate into one variable and the Y coordinate into another variable, okay? So with this, uh, you basically have um, 14 landmarks, so that gives you 28 variables, okay? And of course, these variables, they go through a process called uh, pro Procrastis, um, alignment whereby the the uh this process actually removes um the effect of translation rotation and scaling okay this is a specialized kind of uh, uh, processing step that i will not um, go through with you but you have to do that processing first before you will get those uh, so-called procrastis procrastis uh, variables all right which you see in the data set so those variables can now be actually uh, worked on using uh, uh, QMode PCA, okay? So let's go back to... Right. Uh, doctor, can you let Tian Yi to join? Because oh. I think she just did see. Okay, I... right. Okay. I think she was in the room just now, but somehow got disconnected. Yep. Okay, thank you. All right, so, so after you have uh, the, the uh, data properly processed, right? So you can just directly apply QMode PCA, right? Uh, very easy to do. In just one, one line of code, you can uh, finish that. Um, and then I show you uh, the principal component plots. Um, I just uh, look at the first three, right? So this is just maybe a, usually after you have done principal component, it uh, just do a draftsman plot of the first few principal components to get a feel, and then uh, you decide which which uh, particular dimensions you want to keep, right? So you so therefore the draftsman plot is actually quite handy. Uh, as a first line of uh, first line visualization uh, procedure, okay. So you can see here very clearly that uh, PC one and PC two um, in this space, it already uh, you can see the clustering very clearly, which is uh, actually not surprising because the different fish species have uh, different body shapes, right? And we actually expect that if we do a principal component, uh, if the data has been processed properly, we must actually get some kind of cluster okay so the other um, so the other components are not important yet 
So you can just settle on uh, PC1 and 2. Okay. Uh, in fact, PC1 already uh, captured 88% of the variation, and followed by PC2, 6%, right? So the first two already capture 94% of the total variation in body shape. Okay. Um, and just one reminder here, QMOD PCA uh, operates on, since it operates on the distance, right, between the samples, there is actually no interpretation for the principal components, yeah? Uh, unlike your R mode PCA, okay? No, no interpretation for the principal components other than uh, as a way of uh, dimensional reduction, okay? And data compression. So uh, this is one of the uh, downside of a Q, Q mode PCA. So if you are able to, uh, if you are able to have the num if you want your principal components to have interpretation, then you must actually uh, run an R mode, all right? Which means if you have got a lot of variables, yeah, you have to sort of like do some variable selection, throw away some variables first, and then only you'll do your principal component, right? If interpretation of the data is important to you. Uh, if you just want to look at clustering patterns without, uh, you just want to do, compression clustering patterns without any kind of, uh, uh, without being too much bothered by interpretation, then, then you can actually uh, do Q-mode PCA, right? Sometimes uh, this is okay if, you're, if you are working with images, for example. Um, images, since you are working with the individual pixels, um, you, won't pro you probably won't have any interpretation for the, uh, pixel variables anyway under R mode PCA. Right. In that case, uh, you just you are just basically concerned with with uh, presence or absence of clustering. Okay. So you can actually run. Uh, have you tried running the R code for this particular example? Anyone? Yes. Um, so are you able to reproduce this uh, figure? Yes. Okay, so it's important for you to to um, duplicate this results, yeah. So because it gives you a feeling, a sense of um, being concrete, right? In the sense that uh, these things are, are not beyond your reach. It's actually within your reach. Um, you just need to, uh, as you become more familiar, these things will will not appear to be uh, very difficult anymore. Okay. All right, so uh, are there any questions that you want to ask me about the uh, QMOD PCA? No, at the moment. Anybody else? Okay, so if there are no more questions, um, we will take a break uh, for now, yeah? Uh, when we come back, we will do the case study for the uh, Wisconsin uh, breast cancer data, all right? Um, so I, I will show you step-by-step um, uh, -step how to approach um, the, the, how to approach uh, the analysis of this this data set um, using using all the methods that we have learned up to this point, okay? Uh, so that you have some idea how to, at least you have some uh, example on how to uh, 
approach uh, this kind of multivariate data the next time you encounter such type of data right, as, a, as a starter, okay, to get some idea about patterns of variation in the data. Okay, so for that, uh, please get ready the Wisconsin data set um, and, and have R with you. Okay, um, and when we come back at eight o'clock, we will, uh, I, I will do the demonstration, all right? So uh, the way I do it is that I will, um, so later I will, I will upload a sample code, okay? Which you should also download the code and then we will run through segments of the code to see what actually happens. All right, and um, please download a particular, uh, our package uh, called uh, this thing. Go to chat. Chat. Okay. So in so in in the R console, you can type the following: um, install packages. Uh, a package called RGL. Okay. So this. This package is um, for you to make three-dimensional plots. Chao Hong, is there a way to understand the singular value decomposition in an intuitive way? Or that why we transform data into distances before uh, performing SVD. No, uh, we do not transform the data into distance before SVD. SVD is directly applied onto the uh, onto the data matrix. Okay, it's uh, but you produce equivalent uh, results. What's the intuition? Um, okay, uh, the, actually from. In eigen decomposition, you actually work with uh, determinants, right? Okay. Um, now, basically, when you work with determinants, uh, especially determinants of uh, of covariance, uh, variance covariance matrices, it it actually uh, estimates some kind of uh, variation in your, it's, a, it's, it's called some kind of a generalized variance. Um, so when you take determinant, right, you're actually capturing some kind of information about um, uh, patterns of variation in your data set. It's actually not very intuitive. Um, I would say the, the, the matrix operations are not very intuitive on their own. It's just that um, it's a kind of uh, rotation, okay? Um, so, so the idea of a uh, principal component is you want to rotate your space, right? Okay, that's, that's intuitive. Um, and how do you rotate that space uh, properly? Uh, it turns out that the uh, it is actually, uh, it's just nicely, uh, turns out nicely that um, it, it connects with the eigen decomposition, right? When, when the mathematicians studied eigen decomposition, they just studied it as a kind of a solution. They were not thinking about this kind of problems, okay? Uh, they just studied it as a kind of uh, interesting uh, solution when you have a particular, if you have a particular structure, right? So, so, you can actually find, um, you can actually solve a system of equations uh, using uh, eigen decomposition. They never thought about it in terms of statistics. So it's just nice that uh, uh, it connects uh, immediately uh, when, when we do this kind of rotation thing. It, it just, it's just something that uh, there's some kind of a, it's just some, some mathematical result that you can directly use in the context of uh, trying to make the rotations so that your variation is uh, maximized. It's just like sometimes when you want to solve some problem that's uh, domain related, but you end up using a quadratic equation to solve the problem. 
uh, it doesn't mean that the people already thought of it, right? It's just that uh, it is a useful tool to, to in, in that sort of situation. So in fact, the SVD even, uh, for me, I, I wouldn't say it's very intuitive, um, but it's just a useful way of uh, producing the, the rotation that is needed so that you can see the data uh, clearly. I mean, in terms of uh, the variation, yeah. Or perhaps there, there is actually some intuitive way, it's just that um, it doesn't occur to me. Maybe some other people are able to explain it. Maybe you can check YouTube and see if there are other people who can actually explain this uh, in a more intuitive way. <laughs> That's all. So that's actually a good question. Um, because usually if you, if you understand the operations intuitively, it's actually better, right? Um, um, it, it actually sticks better in memory. But um, I think in this case, uh, so far, I, I, I myself, I cannot find anything that is uh, very intuitive other than, you know, it's a... It's, uh, is a mathematical method. So since, okay, uh, doctor, so since this tumor PAT I see that uh, there are a lot of things that perform here, like this, finding the average horizontally, then vertically, then minus away. Because this is like a lot of steps, ma. so I'm like thinking, oh, is there an intuitive way to, to understand this? Because surely, after after maybe one to two weeks, I will forget about this. <laughs> this like, this oh. is taking this step to, to reach that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, you, you. Yeah. Sure. So you don't. You don't actually need to remember that. Um, so so generally, you just conceptually, you just need to know that the eigen decomposition in Q mode is applied on the distance in in the distance matrix. Uh, of course, and then there is some transformation in the distance that's needed um, before you actually apply the eigen decomposition because. Um, if your diagonal is all zero, right, the eigen decomposition will fail. Okay, so um, if you ask me why why you do it in that way, I also cannot explain to you. Okay, it's just that uh, somebody tried it and um, that gives certain kinds of uh, desirable results. Okay. Um, yeah, I see, I agree that later the, the if you go interview then the interviewer asks you, Oh why? Then can I remember? <laughs> Just mm, I get some some interviewer they try to ask that oh, why there's a lambda inside random forest. They, they try to ask uh, but then maybe they also don't know one. Uh. Just mm. Yeah, there's definitely <laughs> interviewers that do that. Yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> My friend Kana already, so I'm like, oh shit, I I also don't know if if I'm gonna ask then <laughs> So, I, I think for this formula, you can actually think it like some sort of standardization because of you can see you are observing the row means and also the column means that you minus the entire mean of the entire data set and minus the point. So that's how I remember this part is like some sort of bias. I mean, I mean bias in the sense that I wanted to standardize the entire data set. So how do I do? What kind of method that I do? That's what I think thought of. Yeah, there's probably a, a, a basis for these kind of things. Um, the, there, there are some, actually some papers, uh, I don't know, but I don't, I'm not sure if we should go into those kind of papers to, um, to actually, I mean, like if you really want to be a perfectionist, you can actually go into the nitty gritty of such things, but that will require a lot of time. And um, you're, you also need to, there's a lot of linear algebra involved. So yeah, so I, I am not sure if it's a good um, investment of time. If, if um, well, it's good to know, know why exactly, right? 
but uh, in terms of the time that you need to spend to get to that level of detail, um, that may be dependent on your uh, situation, right? Um, but I think uh, even even for singular value decomposition, there's a lot of theory. It's just too technical to to really go completely into it, right? Um, to to know if you want to find out how technical it is, you, you just go uh, you just go to look at the wiki page, right? You can see all the things, and uh, you probably don't want to wait through that. Um, and uh, I think. It, it doesn't really uh, affect your ability to use. I mean, like knowing the theory is one thing, right? Um, but uh, whether you can use it uh, skillfully is another, is another story. Um, so I guess over here, we, we try to balance the two things, right? Otherwise, uh, you may know, know a lot of the theory, but you, you absolutely don't know how to use it to achieve um, to work with the data sets that you have. Yes, agree. In fact, uh, if you look at the, let me see, let's go to R, yeah. Uh, that's, that's a good question now because, uh, well, I, I, again, you, it's also, Correct that sometimes when people ask you some questions, they they may actually don't know the answer themselves. They just kind of like see how you say, <laughs> okay. Uh, unless they are very well versed in linear algebra, so but then uh, such people are not not very common. Um, R console. Stop. Oops. Um, I should be sharing my my R console. Okay. Okay. Oops. Do you see my R console? Do you see my R console? Yes. Okay. Uh, what happened? Never, never mind. Okay. So um, I don't know. It seems like. Okay, never mind. Okay, so suppose that let's have a, let's make some kind of construction, right? If you have a matrix, uh, let, let's construct an artificial matrix like this. Uh, on the diagonal, I, I put all the values on the diagonal, yeah? Okay, so if you compute the determinant of this matrix, um, it, it basically is just a product, yeah? Okay? So I, I will think of this, uh, this, this uh, matrix as a variance-covariance matrix, okay? It, here, your, your variables are all uncorrelated with each other. They are indep purely independent, yeah? Okay? So in this case, if you look at the determinant, uh, it's 100, so times, if it's a diagonal matrix, then the determinant is equal to the product of the diagonals. So it's a very large value, okay? Now, if you, uh, it doesn't matter. If, as long as you have some particular pattern on your matrix, right? Your determinant will basically be um, quite large. Okay, let's look at uh, some other possible examples. Let's say I, I swap. I swap the position, yeah? So I put 100 here. So 
put that one and then here I'll put 100. Okay, so you can also calculate the determinant of M, right? So again, uh, this is a very large value except that it has a negative sign, right? So the sign is kind of like giving you some idea about the direction, okay? But still it's very large, right? Which is telling you that if you have certain patterns in your matrix, the determinant will be large. And um, you know that in, in, uh, when you do eigen decomposition, right, the, your eigenvalues are related to your, um, your eigenvalues are related to your, it's obtained from solving the determinant, yeah? Okay, so if, let's look at some other examples. Uh, if, if let's say now your M is uh, consisting of values that are more or less uh, spread out, uh, so more or less uh, uniform, right? So let's say I put 90 here, so I put 90. Okay, so, okay, so the matrix looks like this. Now let's try to calculate the determinant, right? Now you see that now the determinant has become uh, much smaller, right? Previously was uh, the determinant uh, was 1 million. Now it's dropped to 28,000. If you make it uh, even more similar, let's say you put 99. If you put uh, them exactly the same, the determinant will be, um, wait, we can actually try that. Okay, let's look at 99. It may become, um, okay, something like this. Okay, look at the determinant of M. Right, drops to 298, very small, relatively small already. So now if you put everything 100, okay, I, I will just change 100 to 99, it's easier. Okay, the determinant is now zero, yeah? So you look at this matrix, right? So the, there's, the values are all evenly spread out in, in the matrix. And this sort of matrix, right, is associated with a zero, a very small determinant, in this case, zero. So, the, so now you have some idea, right, that um, the, intu the intuition with the eigenvalue and with the determinant is that if there's some kind of pattern of, uh, variation in your variance covariance matrix, then you, you tend to have some uh, eigenvalues that are large, okay? Uh, if more or less your variance covariance matrix consists of values that are more or less the same, then um, all your eigenvalues will tend to be small, yeah? So, <clears throat> yeah, that's one way to kind of intuitively get some idea uh, how come there's a, how does the determinant actually come out and affect uh, the amount of variation in your data? Okay. But this is actually just a very, just kind of like an intuitive feel, all right? Okay, uh, well, it's 7.30, so let's uh, take a break now, yeah? Okay, um, a good discussion from uh, all of you. So I'm pausing the recording now. Recording now, okay. Right, so I'm going to read the, so I actually have the document. Uh, so have you downloaded the Wisconsin case study R script? Yes. Okay. So, so the first thing is we're just going to read the file. So I'm just going to run. So I just run that, right? So I, I read the file, Wisconsin Breast Cancer Data File, and I, the first thing that I do is uh, I, I check the column names, right, to see what variables are there, okay? 
and then I um, and for this problem, right? Um, okay, so maybe you can see that the there are quite a few variables. Maybe you are puzzled with the variables. So let me show you. So. So you got variables called uh, radius mean, texture mean, perimeter mean, and so on until fractal dimension mean. And then you have radius SE, texture SE, perimeter SE until um, fractal dimension SE, and then you have uh, radius words and so on and so forth. So basically you only have, uh, I think 10 variables, uh, radius, texture, perimeter, area, smoothness, compactness, concavity, Concrete points mean symmetry and fractal dimension, right? Um, the rest are basically repeated, but they are, they are talking about different aspects of these variables. Like your radius have got three aspects, mean, SE, and worst. Um, the worst is uh, some kind of an uh, extreme value from, from, for this aspect, okay? Now, how do you actually get these three values, uh, three variables out? So, um, so briefly explain the how do you get this. Now this data is actually generated from image data, right? So so you have uh, someone, okay? You take a biopsy, right? Okay, so you got tissue tissue samples, tissue samples, and then which is basically um put under the slide, right? They prepare a slide, cells. Okay, they put it under the slide, okay? You know, stain, you, there's a staining, yeah? So, and then it goes to under the microscope, right? So your microscope will look something like this. You put a slide here, right? And then uh, you can actually uh, visualize. Okay. You magnify, la. I say magnify 100 times and then you visualize, you will see the cells. La. The cells will, <clears throat> there are some normal cells and there are some cancer cells, right? The normal cells are usually maybe well behaved like this. Then you have uh, cancer cells, right? So, so it's, it's actually an image, right? So then I take the pictures and for, for each image, they will count, they will look at the cells, right? Now actually they don't count it manually. They, they actually write, uh, this data set is generated from some sophisticated algorithm. They, there's actually an algorithm for image processing uh, that they actually uh, kind of like can trace the contours of the cells here, right? And then they, for each of the cell, I mean like this is defined as a cell, defined as a cell, defined as a cell. So then they will, they will go and measure the center of these cells. And then they estimate like some kind of radius, right? So they may be like roughly, um, maybe they, they make four directions and then they take the average, right? That will represent the radius, right? And so on, right? So for each cell here, there's actually one radius. There's also, so I'll put R, R1, R2, R3, and so on. Like if there are 100 cells here, there will be R100. So your mean radius is basically just averaging uh, all of this uh, 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 all the radius of the cells, yeah? You average that. Then you have the, well, in, I think it's called radius, radius uh, mean, right? Then you have uh, some quantity called radius SE, which is basically the, you take the standard deviation of your radius, and then you divide by the square root of N. The square root of N is because you want to normalize this. In this case, you normalize it because in some slides, right, there may be more cells. Okay, in other slides, there may be less cells. If you don't divide by, you, if you don't normalize by the square root of n, um, the, the, cell, the slides with more cells, right, they will have higher SD, right? So basically your SE is to normalize the SD, okay, in this case. 
and then so this is one aspect. Uh, the the mean is one aspect. The, this uh, SE is one aspect. Then the last aspect is worst. So over here they will look at the. I think they might actually look at the outlier. Okay, they look at some outlier in this. Uh, maybe like for example, maybe this cell is very weird. All right. So you identify this cell, and then it will just report um, its. Um, so you just take this cell and then the, the radius was, will be basically just the radius of this cell, all right? Along with other, uh, so this is for radius. So you have other variables like texture, uh, compactness or whatever. So th these are basically uh, other aspects of this cells, uh, okay? So as you can see, this is somewhat similar to the landmark data, right? And landmark data, you have two, X, Y coordinate. So one landmark then generates uh, two variables. So here is the same thing. Your radius, right, has got three aspects here. One aspect is the mean, the other aspect is the SE, the other aspect is the uh, worst. So it, one, one variable generates, so one um, uh, domain variable then generates three uh, variables, okay? It induces three variables for data analysis. Okay, uh, so is this part clear to you? Um, do you not? Do you need more explanation, or is it is this clear to you? How the at least you have some idea how the data vectors are generated from the raw data. Okay. All right. Now, um, so this is how it goes. Um, so the question now is if you are going to have something, if you're going to come up with something that's interpretable, right? Um, so how should you proceed with this uh, study? Um, now, if you have studied some statistics, you know that there's a quantity called um, coefficient of variation. Coefficient of variation, which is basically uh, SD over the mean. Because um, just by looking the SD, right, we, we cannot know whether it's, whether it's large or small, it actually uh, is relative to the mean, right? So when you divide, it gives you the correct perspective of uh, whether your SD is large or not relative to the something, which is the mean. So in this case, uh, you basically take the SE over the mean. If you take something like this, this will give you some idea about uh, whether your, um, so this is basically SD over mean uh, square root of N. Like it's basically the coefficient of variation uh, scaled by square root of n, okay? Um, <clears throat> so basically this quantity, right, if you, de so, so for example, if you take radius SE divided by radius mean, so this will achieve uh, a dimensionless uh, quantity, right, because both of them will have the same unit, right? And therefore the unit cancels. So it becomes like some kind of a, an indicator for how variable, right, uh, are the uh, cells in this slide, okay? If, if, for example, if you have a slide like this, if your cells are more or less the same cells, the cells are more or less consistent like this, then your SE, right, if you're looking at radius, right, the SE will be more or less uh, small, relative to your uh, mean, right? So, so when you take the radius uh, SE over radius uh, mean, this quantity will be close to zero because they're all, all like more or less consistent. If you have another slide where the cells are kind of like 
very variable. Like some of them are like this, some of them are like this, some of them are like this, like this, like this, right? So there, there's a lot of variability, right? Okay, so your SE will be pi. Um, the mean may be more or less uh, the same as this one. So, so in this case, when you take the ratio, right, your, your ratio will be actually larger. Therefore, it's telling you uh, that your cells are like, like uh, with respect to the radius, it's actually more like uh, this situation rather than this situation, okay? So, so by doing this construction, right, it gives you something that is, uh, it tells you something about the variability, okay, of certain aspects in, in the uh, image. Okay, so um, for me, I would uh, I would uh, do the analysis like as follows. I would first actually um, construct the variables by uh, all the variables by taking the SE to mean, right? And then I'll keep the worst ones. The worst ones are, are kind of like, uh, um, because you are trying to detect cancer, right? So we we always on the lookout for as as long as you have got one case that is very strange, that is already a warning sign. So I would say I would keep the variables for the worst ones, but then uh, for the other two where you are actually looking at the uh, um, um, multiple cells, right? I would actually uh, construct such uh, variables. So I take the SE and divide by mean. Okay. So this is the step that I would do. Let me go back to the R console. Okay. So now, um, now it, suppose we ignore this, right? Um, for someone who is new to principal component, and maybe if you don't think about this uh, too much, right? Um, you can just straight away and uh, do your principal component, uh, no problem. Let's see what we get, okay. Okay, so I've run the, I've already run the script. Um, now you can see that when I'm running my principal component, uh, I'm using Printcom, yeah? So this is an R mode uh, PCA. So I, I then activated core equals to true, yeah? I'm, I'm doing eigen decomposition on the correlation matrix. The reason is because uh, all these variables, right? The order of magnitude is very different. If you check the data, you can see that very clearly. Okay, you can see their order of magnitude is uh, very different, right? A radius mean is uh, up to tens, in the order of tens. Um, and then you have, what do you have? You have got a uh, parameter mean is like up to hundreds, uh, area mean up to thousands and so on and so forth, okay? But then some of them are that are up to uh, down to two decimal places. So if you use the covariance matrix, it won't work because uh, you will get basically just get dominated by the variable that has the largest um, magnitude. All right, so you'll just get artifacts. Okay, so you in this case you have to activate uh, correlation equals to true. So if you do that, so I'm going to share the result with you. Do you see the plot? Yes. Okay. So you see that uh, roughly, right? Um, it's pretty good, even even if you kind of like just do it as a newbie, right? Um, you find that principal component uh, one is actually quite important. Um, you can more or less see that there's a split, right? But there is also quite a substantial amount of overlap between the blue and the red. Uh, if you highlight that, I'm going to just zoom in. I can't, I can't zoom anymore. 
Okay, you can you can see that the so one and two, right? So you can see that they actually uh, at at this side here, there's actually a bit of a overlap, right? Okay, but but uh, as a first approximation, this seems uh, pretty good. Okay. Now I'm going to show you uh, what happens if so. This is done using. Um, uh, just directly, right? Naively, without doing any sort of processing. This is usually what, um, if you, you if you give it to someone with a computer science background, this is what they will usually do. They'll they'll just treat every variable as some data and just don't just throw everything inside. Okay. Um, now you can do something more refined. Okay, like uh, what I suggested just now, which is you divide, uh, you take the SE to uh, ratio of mean. But in this case, you have to be a bit careful. You can't just directly divide it, okay? Because uh, some of these values, right, they are, their values are zero. So the, the denominator is actually zero. So if you divide, you'll get uh, uh, e either not a number or some infinity number, okay? So that doesn't work. So uh, to overcome this, right, okay, so to overcome this, uh, chain e. uh, I mean, sorry, Dr. Khan, chain ABC e again. Okay. <laughs> so, so can you see my console? Yes. Okay. Now you see my console here. I cause, uh, now I define the new object I call bc.new. Yeah? It's actually a data frame consisting of uh, these following variables. So, um, from BC column 13 to 22, you can see that from column 13 to 22, they, they are the SE versions, yeah? You can actually um, just do some simple counting, you can see that. Now I added some uh, very small number there, 0 0.0001, right? Uh, this is to, to break the zeros, yeah? The, the values that are zero will get broken, okay? They will become uh, non-zero, right? Uh, of course, it adds a bit of a noise into the data, but this is irrelevant because uh, I put uh, up to four, I, I'm using four decimal places. So uh, even though I insert artificial uh, noise inside here, it will not actually affect the conclusion of this data. Okay? It's, it's just like uh, adding one uh, small tiny grain of sand, right? But uh, with the effect that it will break the, the problem of dividing by zero, okay? So I uh, to, so that's why to be fair. So for both variables, I added zero point zero 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 one. Okay, so that breaks the division by zero situation. Um, and then BC uh, column twenty three to thirty two are the worst, right? So the the at the worst aspects of the uh, I think ten variables. Okay, nine or ten. Um, and then the last one, BC dollar sign diagnosis, is to pull out the class label. Okay, so that is my new data set, right? Um, then I can check my column names. Okay, so you can see the column names, right? Of course, um, you see that it's still radius SE because uh, it's, it's using the variable, the old variable name of the first um, variable that you use in the ratio, okay? Uh, of course, you can rename it, but um, uh, I'm a bit lazy to do that, all right? So, so I'll just keep that in mind. Uh, so, so you just note that BC dot new your radius underscore SE is actually a coefficient of variation, okay? Because it has already been divided, all right? Okay, and once you have prepared the new data, so I can uh, apply principal component on this data set, all right? So very easy, just run print com on the new data set. But notice that I, uh, when I, I didn't just put bc.new, yeah, because my bc.new, my class label is at the last column. If you just put bc.new, you will get errors because your class label is not a numerical data. Principal component only on the data, yeah, not, in, not the class label, okay? So that's why you see that I put a minus sign there, minus sign, now uh, I'm I'm lazy to actually count the number of columns, so 
I will just let R decide the number of columns, right? So I'll just use n call is, is asking for number of columns, right? For the matrix bc.new. So basically it will remove the last column of the data uh, from the data matrix for me, right? And uh, my correlation is activated to be true, all right? To, so that I don't get artifacts yeah, resulting from uh, having different order of magnitudes between the variables, okay? So I run this. And uh, let me show you the result. So, okay, not yet. So, um, after running this, I'm going to okay. So I then do the uh, pairwise uh, scatter plot. Okay, so this is the pairwise uh, scatter plot. Um, okay, can you see the scatter plot? Yes. yes. Okay, so now you you can also see that the it's actually more compact, right? The the shape of the cluster is actually uh, I would say it's better. Okay, in fact, um, if you ask me, right, I would actually consider, um, I would actually consider looking at one, three. Although one, two also works, but um, let's look at one, three, right? No harm, because, uh, so one, three is actually, uh, sorry, it, it's this, this, one three, one, three tends to be more compact. Uh, you see that the blue one is actually, more compact here and here. So let's look at one tree. So I will plot uh, one tree. Yeah. By the way, you can uh, run the summary of the principal component to see the amount of variation that's explained by uh, the various principal components, okay? So, Share the, uh, the console. Okay, can you see my console? Yes. Okay, so you look at the summary, it will give you the um, proportion of variation that's explained, right? So we have 37.6% for the first principal component, second component 20.4%, uh, third component 129 and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, the cumulative is uh, uh, given by the uh, third row, okay? So now uh, let's look at the plot of one tree. Okay, can you see a one tree? Can you see the scatter plot? Yes. Okay. So this looks like uh, the, looks pretty good, right? The, the cluster of blue and the red, they are more or less uh, separated by uh, PC of PC1. Um, cut off at uh, zero, uh, more or less, okay? But um, there's some advantage in actually, um, even though like one variable is, uh, seems like okay to summarize the variation, but uh, perhaps uh, using one more dimension is uh, no harm, yeah? Because uh, one dimension may be too few, so we can keep two. Um, now, if you're going to use uh, this uh, in the sense of, um, uh, machine learning, right? So you already, let's say this is your training set, right? So more or less you already know that uh, your, um, your, your machine learning uh, uh, exercise is going to be quite successful because your data is already showing very good uh, clustering patterns, okay? And generally, uh, 
um, a very simple way to uh, do classification in this case would be given this this uh, this space, right? You could use a maximum likelihood uh, method, uh, which which we call the kernel method, yeah, uh, as follows. Uh, maybe I sketch this. So you, so I'm just going to reproduce more or less. Um, so just now we had something like this. Okay, so then we had uh, the blue ones. So you got, you got blue ones like this. Uh, wait, let's draw, okay. So we've got a whole bunch of blues. So uh, at parts where there are more blues, they will be like denser, right? And then we had the red ones. There were a bit of red, one or two reds there, but otherwise they are kind of like faded here. So one way to actually um, use a statistical method to do a uh, classification would be the following. You use this training set, right, to uh, estimate the uh, kernel density. So you can do a non-parametric uh, estimation of some kind of a uh, 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 density. So, like for example, you can have a like you you can have a smooth curve, right? For for data that's like this, right? Okay. So, so this is actually a density, right? A cur we I can use a kernel density. A kernel density is a non-parametric way of estimating a curve to fit the data, where the uh, curve uh, is found by uh, minimizing some kind of uh, uh, error criteria, okay? So in this case, uh, it's the same. So for your blue, you can actually estimate a, a two time. So this is like, um, it has a height, right? So you can kind of like have a, a density, okay? So, and you can have a contour uh, plot on that. So for example, the, the ones that are very dense here, this is like a mountain, right? You think of having a mountain and you cut it at uh, certain segments so that, um, that the cutoff segment represents a certain uh, proportion, all right, of the, of the uh, density, all right? So for example, the, the section there's, uh, so the, this section here may, may represent like 90% uh, of your uh, data. This may represent like uh, 80% and so on and so forth. The, the ones at the edges here will represent generally very low, okay? So the other one may be estimated like this. So as long as there's a few data, there will be less, but then the more data here, there will be like more concentrated, right? So basically you, you, you have, uh, if you look at this from a 3D perspective, right? It's basically like there's a, estimated there's some, some kind of a, so your, your, your data points here. So it's kind of like estimated there's some kind of a mountain like this. And um, so then you have your dots here. So this one you estimate another mountain, right? So of course they, they will have some kind of over minor overlap, right? So then for, to decide, right? Let's say you have a data point that is falling, let's say in this region. Okay, to decide whether it's blue or red, right? I will, um, I will compare the, the height, right? So the height is actually the density. Okay, I'll compare the density of the blue against the red. If the blue is uh, higher than the red, I will classify it as the blue. Okay, so it basically this, this works out uh, using a, like, a likelihood method. Okay, it's like uh, you have to have some imagination, yeah. Like uh, there's a certain height, right? 
so 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 there's a certain so you have a point here so you make a projection upwards um, so it touches the blue one there's a certain height then it, it will also touch the red one at a certain height okay so you you pick you will assign the class according to which height is actually uh, uh, larger okay with that uh, you can actually perform your machine learning classification very easily all right um, this is this is a very intuitive method which is uh, basically based on likelihood and um, um, and because it's two-dimensional space, uh, it's easy to visualize the, the, the space of your uh, uh, density, right? That's associated with a particular class, okay? Of course, uh, it doesn't mean that you should stop at two dimension, right? Uh, in fact, four, five dimension is also fine. It's just that in that case, uh, I'm not able to uh, sketch out anything for you to see, okay? It becomes like more abstract. Okay, um, is it clear to you what is going on here? Yeah. Anyway, we will learn how to do all these uh, things later. Um, how to actually in practice, how to implement these things later, yeah, when we come to the machine learning part. But this is just to tell you that uh, even at this stage, when you do a principal component, um, if you see such a kind of clustering pattern, you already have a pretty, you're already pretty confident that your machine learning uh, uh, work will produce uh, good results later, okay? If at this stage you're at the principal component part, um, the clustering patterns are not fantastic, uh, then you may, you may actually just expect uh, maybe quite modest kind of results, okay? All right, so let me go back to the uh, R console, yeah? Okay, so can you see my R console? Yes. Okay, so now uh, since we did R mode uh, PCA, we want to actually try to interpret the loadings, right? So I use uh, one and three just now. So let's look at the loadings, yeah? You can extract the loadings by using uh, the dollar sign loadings. In fact, if you want to look at the what, options are available under the print com output. You can use the str command, yeah? Um, which gives you the structure, okay? So you can see that um, your, after you run the uh, print com, right? There are actually uh, multiple objects returned. Uh, SDEV is the standard deviation, which is the square root of your eigenvalues. Then you've got loadings, and then uh, some other things like the scale, um, number of observations. So the scores are your principal component scores, yeah? Okay, um, so if you look at the loadings, so I've already stored it as an object called W. Okay, you can type W and you can uh, see, you can compare, yeah? Now actually, principal component tree, just now when you saw, um, they are more or less, just useful for defining another axis so that you can use a, you can actually estimate a kind of like a better uh, kernel density, right? Um, so we are just going to focus. So the most of the separation actually comes from the first principal component. So we will focus our interpretation on the first principal component, okay? Now, when, when you first see this kind of loadings, right? There are too many decimal places. The first thing that you should do is to round it to uh, maybe two decimal places. Okay, so I will round W to two decimal places. Okay, because the, the extra decimal places are basically just disturbing you from concentrating, okay? All right, so you can see the cleaner version now. So let's focus on the component one, right? Okay, now look at the magnitude and the sign of the uh, 
loadings for the variables. What can you say? Look at the sign. Which ones are going to negative? Um, so we couldn't see the result. Oh, you can't. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you see my console? We are looking at the the check the loading. Yes, your mouse. The check the loading is the blue equals to PCA dot BC dot blue. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. That's the code. Um. Okay, can you see it now? Can you see my R console? Still the code. Still the code. Uh, wait. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, can you see? Yes. yes. Okay, it's the R console, right? So you can see that, uh, okay, just now, uh, Right, I was talking about the structure. So you can actually use the structure on any uh, R output to see what are the uh, objects that you can access inside, okay? They're actually rich objects. Uh. Once you run some of this analysis, they can, the output may contain uh, multiple objects and you can access these objects by pulling them out using the dollar sign, okay? So your W uh, is your uh, I, uh, your eigenvectors the eigenvectors for PC one and PC three, but there are too many decimal places, so I round them right to two decimal places. Okay. So you can see more clearly now, right? Okay. Now we are just going to focus on the first principle component. Okay. So what can you see? What do you notice in this? Uh, what do you notice about the loadings? Generally positive. A any other uh, observations? Others? Mm, the one with the words contribute more generally. Okay. Any other observations? Just give your observations. Yeah. We're trying to, to kind of like uh, get some exercise in interpreting the principal components. The concavity is actually having a higher magnitude. Okay, they, well, the values are, we, we like, okay, they, it's kind of like a relatively high value, right? Uh, if you compare it against the others. Um, okay, first thing, right, we, let's look at which variables are relatively unimportant. Can you see which variables are relatively un unimportant in affecting your PC one? The fractal dimension. Okay, there are two, right? Compactness uh, and fractal dimension, right? These two because uh, it's 0, 0.0 something, yeah? It's already quite small. So these two don't actually affect that much, right? And 
what else? Uh, what is the other observation that you'll see? What variables have similar kinds of uh, loadings? Does it surprise you that uh, radius, perimeter, and area they are loading about the same? Does it surprise you? I'm sorry, Dr. Khan, would you mind to repeat your, your sentence just now? Okay, I, I offer you an, an observation. Look at radius, perimeter, and area. Their loadings are the same. Does that, does that actually uh, surprise you? No, because I think it's actually a linear, com linear combination. I mean, a formula of those, right? The perimeter and area is a formula of radius. Right. You, the fact that you see that they are all the same, right, is because, uh, well, basically, they are, they are just redundant information, okay? Um, that's why they are contributing the same amount of information, you see? Um, your radius, your perimeter, and your area are, are contributing. Because your area and perimeter, your area is a function of radius, uh, a square uh, function of your radius. Okay, so, so basically it's not surprising and in fact, if you want to improve interpretability of principal component one, you should rerun it by removing, uh, well, depending on which one, you, you just keep one of them that is uh, most meaningful from a subject matter point of view. Uh, you either keep radius only, perimeter only, or area only. Okay, because, they are, because you, when you have these three things inside the principal component, uh, they affect your interpretation, yeah? Because you, you got the redundant things like appearing, uh, coming out, okay? So, so I would advise to rerun and uh, keep just one, okay? Uh, and what else? That's why you can, you, you also see that for radius, uh, radius worse, perimeter worse, and area worse, they're all, also about the same. Okay, so that's one observation, yeah. So uh, similar, so features that are kind of like talking about the similar things, they may tend to have um, loadings that are also similar, okay. Like for example, concavity and concave points, they appear to be talking about the same thing as well because you look at this, they are about the same. And also over here, they are more or less the same. Now, okay, so fine, uh, but so maybe now you can tell me uh, what values, right, will get pushed to relatively larger principal component one and which will get pushed to relatively uh, negative principal component one, which one? Notice this, right? These are all positive, right? So if they are positive and the value is actually large, they will get pushed to. You get pushed to the positive side, right? Yes. And the positive side, uh, the red color is actually the malignant uh, cancer cells. This is telling you that the malignant cancer cells, right? Uh, they tend to have larger radius, uh, larger values of texture, and uh, larger values of uh, smoothness, compactness, continuity, and so on and so forth. Right? They tend to have larger values of these things. Okay, including the, so on average, their radius is, okay. Uh, on average, there is also more uh, variability. Okay, you see that uh, this one is also contributing to positive loading, right? which is telling you that uh, in the malignant cells, right, it consists of cells that have, uh, tend to have higher variation in terms of the radius, okay? Whereas the benign ones, they usually are more consistent, yeah? So uh, the more consistent, so they have actually lower uh, radius, 
coefficient of variation. So they get pushed to the left. And uh, in fact, they will have a higher tax, higher variation in terms of the texture, uh, coefficient of variation, higher smoothness, uh, coefficient of variation. But most important, they are more. Uh, they are these are two two that are more important, right? Uh, higher concavity and concave points, right? The variation is actually higher for uh, benign cells. That's why they get pushed to the left side, yeah, uh, in the principal component plot. Okay, so 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 do you get some idea now how to interpret the first principal component? Yep. So, so this is uh, the interpretation is basically done by looking at uh, uh, the loadings, right? The magnitude and their sign, right? Then we look at the, the, the loadings. If they are positive sign, they push push the values to the right hand side, okay? Right hand side of PC one. Those that are negative loadings are negative. So large values of for that they push to the left hand side. Of course, this one you can actually uh, see it more clearly in a by plot. So you can type by plot um, PCA dot BC dot mu. This one is not in the in the script that I gave you, but you can actually just it's a very simple function. Just type a uh, by plot. Yeah. Um, that we have. Oh, sorry, by plot. <laughs> Since you are using looking at one and three, so we will have to adjust this a bit. I think it's by plot. Uh, let me see. Something like this, uh, by plot one three. Okay, um, then I share the screen. Right, can you see the by plot? Yes, okay. The by plot is just basically just to help you, um, kind of like, uh, look at your principal, so look at your loadings, right? Um, so they draw arrows, so which actually kind of like is more like graphical, right? It tells you that uh, which values they push the. If certain uh, samples have are high in certain variables, they get pushed to the, in that particular direction, right? So this is actually kind of like a more intuitive way to uh, to to understand the loadings. Okay, so you can see the following. Um, so mostly you can see uh, uh, smooth. The longer the arrow is, the stronger uh, is the, the length of the arrow is uh, related to the magnitude of the loading. Yeah? So arrows that are long means they are influential. Short arrows are not influential. And uh, since this is a vector, it has an X and Y component, right? So like for example, um, if you look at this concavity SE, right? So, so it's an X component is actually much larger than its Y component, indicating that it is primarily pushing towards the, uh, the left hand side. Okay, so you can see, um, so this actually helps to tell you that why certain variables end up in certain space. Like for example, you look at um, some, some of these uh, values in component three, right? They get pushed up, right? They get pushed up here because their fractal dimension, the worst fractal dimension is actually uh, um, high. Okay, so they get pushed up here, right? But these are just a minority of uh, samples, so uh, may not be worth looking at. But it depends, right? Sometimes uh, if, you, if you are more investigative, you might actually go and trace back the slides from these samples and then uh, make more studies, right? So this is also one possibility of how to use uh, results from a 
principal component to to comprehensively study the, the samples. So biplot is something that is usually we this biplot is actually too rough to be included in a formal report. Um, uh, it's more for the purpose of uh, interpreting your your um, loadings yeah, in, a, in a graphical way. If you want to include a biplot in any report, unfortunately, you will have to do some kind of manual. Um, um, you can actually superimpose that in, onto your uh, scatter plot, um, but you will have to scale them uh, appropriately so that the arrows kind of like appear on the plot. Okay, um, that one maybe for a more advanced uh, kind of uh, setting, uh, you may do that. But at this stage, I just want to uh, introduce to you how to use it for interpretation. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, um, console. Okay, can you see my console? Yes. Okay. So, uh, all right, fine. So now we want to, having seen all these things, right, we would actually like to uh, check the data, right, to see whether um, uh, what we feel, what, what we find from the loadings is generally corresponds to the ground truth. So we can actually make uh, box plots, right, to see the distribution of these variables that have uh, loadings that are uh, high in magnitude, right, and uh, in a different direction. So um, I have, a, so I make a series of box plots. There are actually six box plots that I make. So I pick certain, um, I already picked certain uh, particular variables so that um, you can actually pick some other variables, okay, no problem. But I just pick those that, that where the effect is most pronounced, yeah? And then uh, I just pick six, all right. You can pick any that you want. So I run this. Um, Okay, and uh, basically then I can uh, look at the result. Okay, wait. I want to first do the box plots. Okay, so I think I overdid it. Uh, let me just go back and do the box plots. Okay, um, can you see my box plots? Yes. Okay. Now the you can see the box plots. Uh, they correspond to so you can see there's a number on the top of the box plot, right? So those are the loadings, yeah. The loadings for that particular variable. So as you can see, uh, minus zero point three is pushing to the left, right? So you see that the B nine ones are the ones that get pushed to the left because for that particular variable, their values are uh, large. Okay. So once they multiply at minus 0 0.3, they become more negative, so they get pushed to the left compared to the M. For some weaker, like minus 0 0.13 is actually weaker, right? The effect is much weaker. So you can see that uh, that's actually verified by the box plot, right? You see that the distribution is actually, it's actually not doing much. Okay, it's actually not pushing, it's just pushing it to the left a little bit only. Um, then the third variable, okay? It's also pushing just a little bit, yeah, because you see that there's a substantial overlap in the distribution, okay? Then, uh, then there are three variables with the positive loadings. 
So here you see that the positive loading will push to the right hand side for uh, values that are large, right? So you see here, uh, this is actually uh, shown. Okay, this particular, uh, the red ones, right? 0 0.35, the, the measurements are also correspondingly high. That's why they get pushed to the right hand side. Same with the 0 0.31. And uh, 0 0.21, uh, as expected, it will be less pronounced. Okay. So the, the loading value here you see is depend. Um, well, we actually will reflect uh, how different are the uh, two classes, okay, it, with respect to their distribution, right, for that particular variable. If, if the two variables are not overlapping too much, the loading will be strong. Uh, the positive negative just indicates a uh, direction only. Okay. All right, so this actually uh, verifies the result from the loading. Right? And uh, based on this uh, result, right, then I asked uh, if you could only pick three variables to represent the data, which would you pick? Okay, so. Um, uh, if it were up to me, right, I would pick uh, this following three variables. I would pick concavity, uh, the coefficient of variation for concavity, uh, concavity worse, and then the radius worse. Okay, this is based on the loadings, right? Uh, if you look at the loadings, okay, uh, Concavity uh, coefficient of variation minus 2.9 something, okay, roughly minus 0 0.3. The concavity worse is 0 0.3, okay, also large. And uh, radius uh, worse is uh, 0 0.31, right. You might be wondering why I didn't pick uh, concave points worse. Uh, that's also possible, yeah. I can also, I can pick concave points worse compared to concavity worse. But if but uh, if I do, if I pick uh, these three variables, right? In fact, I only need to measure uh, two kinds of features in the image data. One is the radius, one is the concavity. Because the, this uh, coefficient of variation and the words are basically just different aspects of concavity. So that would save me from uh, having to calculate one entirely different aspect of um, the feature from the data, all right? Uh, of course, you, you can, there's no harm in trying uh, concave points worse, yeah? Because it's uh, order of magnitude is actually uh, large, okay? So you, you can actually uh, modify this and see what, what you get, okay? So anyway, if I proceed, right? If I proceed to do this, what do I get? Uh, Dr. Khan, actually, we couldn't see your console. E, uh, yeah, okay, okay, just a minute. Okay, can you see now? Can you see the console? Yes. You can see the console, yeah? Okay. You see, I was just talking about the, uh, why I chose these three uh, variables, okay? Because it's basically just based on observing the uh, order of, uh, so looking at the magnitude of the loadings. Okay, so let's run this, okay? So I'm, if I can only pick three variables, so those are the three that I will pick, and then I can actually do a pairwise Get a plot to look at them, right? So, got the uh, scatter plot. Okay, so this is the scatter plot, right? Right, uh, you can see that the, the uh, clustering is not bad, right? You only use three variables, you know. Um, in fact, since you are not using a uh, principal component, so, so directly you are just interpreting the, the graph based on the variables directly themselves. So this, this uh, graphs will have very high interpretability, yeah? very direct. You don't need to 
kind of like uh, appeal to checking the loadings or whatever. Okay, it, it will be very intuitive for the domain uh, expert to look at. Okay. So basically you can see that uh, more or less they are, yes, they are actually two clusters. Okay. So you can actually, um, so if you want, you can actually visualize this in a three dimensional space, all right? So I'll just show you how to do that. Uh, but usually three-dimensional space uh, is more like uh, for your own self-exploration. Maybe when you do a presentation, it's cool uh, to show a 3D plot and rotate it and maybe impress some people. Okay. Um, but otherwise, if you are just writing a report and all that, I would say um, because you are not able to rotate the the, the three-dimensional plot interactively, right? So uh, compared to, let's say, in a presentation, you can do that. So, so you might as well just give the three pairwise uh, scatter plots uh, so that your, your reader can actually kind of like uh, look at one, two, one, three, two, three, right? The, the different aspects of it, okay? So let's do the... Uh, So let's do the 3D plot now. So, so you have to run the library uh, called RGL, yeah? Um, so you have to install that first. So I presume that you have installed it and uh, Oh, I haven't installed it, so I have to do that. RGL. Elimination. Uh, what's happening? I have an error. I whether it has okay so uh, I'm not sure maybe there's something wrong with the uh, not sure so I don't want to troubleshoot that uh, for my MacBook um, have you tried doing it on, on your maybe in your other platforms like Windows and all that does it work Anyone has tried that? It works, right? Uh, okay, then in that case, I want somebody to share the screen and show the show that um, plot and maybe just rotate it for everyone to see. Uh, who wants to share? I'll make you host. Anyone who actually has the that thing running in your R console now? I'm still installing the RGL package. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, who who has it uh, on the screen now already? Okay, Zi uh, Yun, yeah. So I'll make you host, yeah. You can share your screen and then uh, share that that uh, particular plot. Um, let me see how to do that. Uh, participants. Make post. Okay. Right. Uh, Zi Yun, you can share the. You can share your screen. 
Yeah, right. Okay. So you can see that, yeah. You can actually make the uh, points actually larger by changing the radius, right? So that you can change it yourself, right? Okay. So my color that I put in is actually a transparent color. So it, it actually, um, so when, at parts where there are overlaps, you can see that the color is actually darker. So you can see that there's actually a more or less some um, compact. Maybe you can try to increase the radius to something larger, maybe two or three times larger and see what happens. You, you may need to close this uh, three-dimensional plot first. Yeah, right. Okay, right. Um, is it larger, the points? Okay. Well, anyway, you, you, you can adjust it, right? You can, uh, the radius, you can set it to some larger value and see, see that the, the points will actually get larger, right? Okay. Uh, Okay, thanks, uh, Ziyun. Yeah, oh, Ziyun. Okay, doing that. Okay. Uh, doctor, I have changed the radius up to fifty, but it turns out to be something like this. <laughs> okay. Um, can I? You can. Can you try something? The type uh -huh. goes to P, right? You change it to S, and then you make your radius uh, maybe smaller. Um, that should give you a, actually plot, plotting it as a sphere rather than as a point. Um, can you try that? So you change the type, right? Now the current type is P, right? Inside the command, eh, you see that the, there's a... Yeah, I'm trying. Uh -huh. <laughs> if it's very big, uh, you tune your radius to some smaller value. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid you might have to close your, every time you redo this, right, you have to close the, the existing uh, device. Otherwise, uh, it, when it kind of like overplots it, it will sometimes give you some kind of messy uh, results. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, right. So that's pretty good. Okay. Can you try rotating? No, uh, I think it hang. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, because it's quite kind of like memory intensive, so... Yeah. Yeah, but uh, they already hang. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that, that is the same thing that happened to me as well. So, okay, but then you can see that the, the data points are kind of like transparent, right? So it gives you some idea of uh, stacking certain area there's like more concentration and certain areas uh, there's actually uh, less, okay? But more or less, uh, this is actually a pretty good result, yeah? It's saying that uh, the clustering is very strong. Um, just based on these three variables, you can already more or less uh, correctly diagnose whether the breast cancer cell is benign or malignant. That's why the, uh, you can rotate it now, is it? Um, it take, takes time. Takes time, huh? Yeah. I think that might be, 
it is not supposed to be like that. Um, I have an old coat where I, when I use it, it's very easy to rotate. You, you won't hang like this. I need to uh, find that coat again. It's hidden somewhere. The current um, argument Maybe that it's use, my laptop issue because computer. it sometimes hangs like this. <laughs> it's not supposed to hang like this. Oh, okay. Uh, it's okay. not supposed to. Uh, it's because I, I use the transparent uh, option here. But oh. I remember using it in uh, some other way. It shouldn't hang like this. Oh, I see. Okay. So, so never mind. That's why uh, I use the type equals to points so that it doesn't hang. Because it oh. hangs my computer as well. Oh, I see. But I thought <laughs> okay. that it, it might be just my computer is old, but uh, it seems like it may be a problem for everyone. Yeah, so don't worry, uh, I'll try to see what is the best way to, to do There's a way to do it so that you can rotate it very easily. Okay. Okay, uh, Okay. thanks, Yuna. Yeah, welcome. Okay. So reclaim host, okay. So, all right. Um, so that concludes um, this uh, particular uh, case study, yeah? So we, we have actually shown how to uh, approach um, how to approach the problem of um, how to even start, right? When, when you're given a data like this, how do you even start looking at it? So I hope uh, the demonstration just now has given you some ideas. So what do you think about this uh, for those who are new to uh, principal component? How do you find this, this approach? Many clustering methods that can give same result. Uh, yeah, well, there, there are different clustering methods, right? Um, so, principal component is one of them. Well, actually, principal component is not exactly a clustering result. It, it is a dimensional reduction result, which uh, after, because you, you already reduce the, the data dimension, right? So it allows you to visualize the, the data space in low dimension. And if you can see that in the low dimension, there are some clusters, right, that can form there. Uh, then if you apply a formal clustering method on the data, it is going, definitely going to work very well. So I guess uh, it is like uh, doing some kind of advanced, it allows you to do some kind of advanced checking whether ap applying a, a formal clustering methods such as uh, hierarchical clustering will actually produce anything meaningful from your data. Is this similar to linear regression and finding variables that are highly, no, no. Uh, principal component is basically just a way to rotate your data right, to transform your data, move your data into a new space so that uh, you can see the pattern of variation more clearly there compared to the original space. It is not a statistical method. So you, you there's no issue of, uh, there's not, not even a model, okay? In linear regression, you assume that the data follows a linear model. There's, there's no such uh, linear model, uh, present in, in uh, principal component. And it's not a statistical matter because you, 
you basically do not actually have, uh, you're not actually modeling variation inside that. It's purely a mathematical model for, uh, for, for transforming your data from moving it to one, from one space to the other space so that any useful variation can be seen more clearly in that space. And definitely we don't use it to find, uh, to, do, uh, to, to do significance tests. So it's actually not, not uh, it's not related. Uh, intro So it's more like at the stage where it, it using principal component can give you a more uh, solid feel about your data. Yeah? Um, compared to if you just look at it, and you don't do any uh, kind of dimensional reduction, the data can be very overwhelming. Okay, It's very hard to describe your data to someone. Uh, with principal component, uh, at least you once you have looked at the pre preliminary results, you can actually you have a good mental picture of how your data actually uh, looks like and what are the variables that actually influence uh, its uh, its uh, important structures, right? Before you go into any formal kind of uh, analysis, so uh, that that is something that is very useful in my opinion. So any other comments from other students? It's more like an exploratory method. Yeah, you're right. It's considered a uh, part of, uh, it can be considered as part of uh, data processing. And also um, depending on how you're going to use the data, uh, you can also consider it as an exploration method. All right, okay, so we are just uh, over time slightly, okay? So I think uh, that will be the, all we want to talk about for this week, yeah, the, the case study, okay? So um, we will be having soon a, uh, let me see, uh, announcements. Okay, so um, yeah, so I, I don't have any assignment for you uh, this week, but uh, because uh, initially I, I put it there, right, uh, week four, right? But I think uh, maybe uh, this is just to give out the assignment and you have uh, kind of like some time to do it, right? So I only give out um, the assignment, uh, which is uh, concerning uh, principal component, yeah? So uh, for you to work on. Um, so uh, this one I will uh, post later next week. Okay. So you will be given like uh, some several weeks to work on it. Okay. So don't worry. Okay. So assignment one basically will be just covering the early part up to uh, today, right? Uh, anything that's related to uh, data processing and also exploration. Okay, so I think uh, that will be all I want to say for today. All right, so thanks for listening. And I'm going to stop the recording now.